Welcome to today's event, Global Malnutrition from the Current Crisis to Long-Term Solutions, brought to you by Results Development Office. Our presenters will be joining us shortly. Before we start, we have a few tips for this webinar. If you have any problems or need assistance with Zoom, please use the chat function to connect with our staff. You're welcome to ask questions at any point using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. Our presenters will answer questions in the second half of the webinar. Closed captioning is available by pressing the CC at the bottom of your screen. This event is being recorded. We will share the link in a follow-up email. Now please welcome Results Executive Director, Joanne Carter. Thanks, thanks so much, Melissa, and greetings everybody. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm the Executive Director of Results and Results Educational Fund based here in Washington, DC. And I'm really excited and honored to be here with all of you and our really special um, guest speakers. Um, I'm, I'm really glad that Results is able to bring this event to Results donors and friends. Um, your support is immensely important to us. Today, you're gonna to hear about the global malnutrition crisis from experts and, and also folks who are close allies and leaders from around the world. And you're also gonna learn about some of the ways that advocacy and your generosity in making that advocacy possible is helping to get life-saving solutions to scale and to where they're needed most. Um, we have a terrific lineup of presenters, including two deeply committed global leaders I've had the pleasure of knowing and working beside for many years. Um, first, Dr. Peter Bujari is um, calling in from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, where he directs Health Promotion Tanzania. <clears throat> and um, he'll be speaking in, in just a, mo a short while, but I'm really honored to have Peter with us today. He's both a dedicated clinician and a hugely effective advocacy leader who always champions the needs of the most vulnerable people across nutrition and health issues in Tanzania, in the region, and globally. And I feel very fortunate to be partners with him in our action global health partnership. Um, and Joel Spicer is joining us from Ottawa, Canada, where he leads Nutrition International. And Joel and I have um, worked together, and I would say schemed together on making big things happen from his time in the Canadian government and at the World Bank. Um, I was really thrilled when Joel took the leadership of Nutrition International, and I have been so impressed to see how he has transformed that organization to be bolder and even more impactful and now a global leader in tackling malnutrition. <clears throat> and I'm really proud to serve on the board of Nutrition International. And you're also gonna hear from two results, brilliant policy experts, Dorothy Monza and Cricket Nikovich. Cricket's gonna be moderating, today, moderating today's discussion, but before I turn it over to her, I just wanna remind us for a moment um, to all of us why this topic is so important. You know, our mission at Results is to build the political will to end poverty. And right from our founding, ending hunger and malnutrition has been a critical part of that mission. And Results was an early and vocal advocate for the child survival revolution. And our advocacy for high impact nutrition interventions, healthcare for women and children, vaccines for preventable diseases has contributed to a nearly two thirds decline in child deaths over the last 40 years. But as many of you know, that progress has been reversed due to the health and economic fallout of COVID-19, as well as the cascade of conflicts and climate shocks and rising costs of food and fertilizer. You know, and even before COVID, malnutrition was the underlying cause of nearly half of all deaths of children under five. You know, the most visible, life-threatening, and terrible form of malnutrition in children is severe wasting. And globally, over 13 million children under five are impacted, and that's the worst we've seen in many years. And that severe wasting robs children of their health and their future. Severely wasted kids are much more likely to die of treatable infections like pneumonia or malaria or measles than a well-nourished child. But we can treat this, and, and increasingly, we can prevent it. You know, and meanwhile, girls and women are also facing nutrition deficiencies that have huge implications for their health and the health of their babies. You know, nearly one in three women of childbearing age, especially those in poorer households, has anemia, which can lead to devastating outcomes like preterm births, postpartum hemorrhage, low birth weight, newborns, and death. And we know more broadly that malnutrition is a big part of the vicious cycle of poverty. And we know that when we interrupt it, the positive effects ripple out for generations. 
for children everywhere to survive and grow and learn. And we have to address nutrition in any discussion about the hunger crisis. And adequate nutrition is also a critical issue for the health and the rights of women and adolescent girls. You know, the Sustainable Development Goals launched in 2015 included ending hunger and all forms of malnutrition by 2030. And yet the prevalence of undernourishment has increased every year since 2020 now. And with seven years remaining to 2030, we are moving in the wrong direction. So today we're here to talk about how we can act to reverse this. So now I wanna bring on Cricket Nikovich, Results Director for Policy and Government Affairs. Cricket leads our anti-poverty and <clears throat> policy and appropriations work on Capitol Hill. She also represents results with the Biden administration and across many of our policy coalitions, <clears throat> including on global health and child health. She's been an integral member of results staff for 16 years and the driving force behind many of our legislative successes. So Cricket, over to you and please take it away. Thank you so much, Joanne. And everyone, I'm just thrilled to be here today with Jenner Stenner, supporters of results and really just results folks. So y'all are the backbone. Um, our grassroots volunteers are the backbone of our, our movement and just glad to be here with you today. Um, I wanted to just remind you first off that you can post your questions in the Q&A tab at any point and we'll save the last 15 minutes or so to answer as many of those questions that we can. So drum roll, our first presenter is Dr. Peter Bajari. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Bajari earned his medical degree at the height of the HIV AIDS crisis in Tanzania and becoming a doctor at that critical time just really did shape his mindset and his life's work as to be a drive and his drive to be a professional advocate. For the past two decades, Dr. Bajari has been a devoted advocate for advancing public health equity in Tanzania. And I, I fondly remember actually um, getting to meet Dr. Bajari um, make, on one of his first trips to DC working with results. Uh, we, we got to, um, we were doing a campaign on uh, the World Bank and the IMF and slashing health fees and making sure that everyone had access to a health center and not having to pay egregious fees. Um, it was a, a really powerful campaign. And I also got to uh, lead him around and do the DC kind of tour and get our pictures made outside those White House gates. Um, but Dr. Bajari is in, back in Tanzania, he's inside those gates often, helping to create and push directly with government to change policies for the better. In his career, he's helped influence Tanzania's policies around HIV, TB, malaria, the full range of maternal child health, but importantly, his work in nutrition has been a linchpin throughout all of that. Dr. Bajari, we are so glad for you to join. I know it's evening there for you. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Thank you, Cricket. Um, nice meeting you again. Good. Um, I, I, I do remember our work in the Capitol here many years back. Um, and it's a pleasure to join this webinar as well, um, to be part of the presenter. Um, I, I personally have grown with the results. Um, I think uh, 16 years now um, with the results. It's been a pleasure a grown personally, but also grown as an organization. Yeah. And the relationship uh, is very um, supportive that we happen to connect nationally and globally. I, it's a pleasure to be part of uh, this global advocacy platform. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bajari. Well, since the last time I saw you, we were in person together, actually, back in Dar es Salaam, back in the fall of 2019. And mm. So much has happened in the world. <laughs> That's the last time I saw you in person, you know, COVID-19 yeah. and the economic yeah. crisis that followed. Um, I'm just I'm just curious and wanting to hear from you a little bit, you know, with these multiple crises that have, have been hitting, um, how has this had an effect on malnutrition in Tanzania? Can you share a little bit about what's been going on the, going on, on the ground in malnutrition and, ch and child health? And is the situation getting worse? Is it getting better? What can you tell me? Yeah, so I, 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 I think uh, the topic of nutrition or nutrition is normally taken lightly uh, than it should be. I should quickly say that when we describe the problem of malnutrition, basically we are largely talking about under five children, 
but also talking about women of reproductive age. Why is that important? It is because children under five years, they are at the period of development and the growth of many organs and functions as well, such as immune system is developing around that time. Brain development is also happening around that time. Uh, bone development, pelvis for women, for instance, developing around that time. So nutrition is critical um, than we can actually think. For pregnant women, you know that the demand for nutrition is normally very high. And so deficiency of nutrition caused a lot of damage than we could have thought, including the inborn um, health uh, challenges and errors. So um, reflecting um, on what has happened in Tanzania, I think there are some areas it's getting better. Um, so like we, we record stunting, for instance, children who are shorter than they, they should have been, um, about three in 10 in Tanzania, children are stunted. In, the, in, the, in some of the regions, it is actually about one in two. So over 50% of the children are stunted. This is not good news, certainly. It is a bad news. Um, in, 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 in households that are of impoverished by the poverty, it's around four in 10 um, of under five children are stunted. When you look at the pregnant women, for instance, women of reproductive age, about three in 10, they have uh, deficiencies of micronutrients, which are important for um, development of the pregnancy and the mother themselves. Um, when you look at anemia, for instance, is one of the um, presentation of the deficiency of uh, iron and folic acid, for instance, you find that nearly half of women who are pregnant are anemic. This is to say that the situation isn't good as much as we're trying to work around those challenges, but, but um, it isn't good as I speak. When we talk about food security in general, um, we see um, from the data that we have about 13 million people, they live below 0 0.6 US dollars per day. 0 0.6 US dollars per day is unable to buy one kilogram of maize flour, for instance, which means that these people are likely to miss even one meal a day. So that is the situation that we are talking about when we describe the food security, for instance, and, 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 and the, the nutrition in terms of the mothers and children. Just to finish responding to your question, <clears throat> I should also say that um, the deficiency of micronutrients leads into ill health meaning increasing the cost of treatment because the immune system is low, but it also affects the learning ability of children. And the studies that has been done in this country does show that, for instance, about 24% of students in grade seven are unable to read the grade three Kiswahili textbook, which means the literacy rate is low. And about half of those in grade three are unable to work out the arithmetics of the grade two that they passed in the previous year. This shows that the impact of malnutrition is probably bigger than we think. Can I end there? Click it. Oh, that's great, Dr. Majori. I, just talking about the interconnectedness and you know, results works also on access to global education and that critical what you're describing as learning poverty, that foundational learning around literacy and numeracy, it's one of our core core campaigns. And so it's so necessary to work on, you know, both the nutrition side and that education side. Um, I have just a couple more minutes with you, but um, just wanted to ask, what do you think is the biggest challenge you're facing in Tanzania in improving malnutrition and child health? The biggest challenge. Um, that is a tough question as well. So the biggest. So I, I, as I look at the landscape um, in the country, I think uh, with a couple of challenges and think I would rank them like the first one, I think, is um, our inability to rally around and gather the political momentum to talk about nutrition. So Joan, in her introduction, says, in every conversation that we have, we should be talking about nutrition. I think our ability to rally political momentum and the leadership 
across the levels of technocrats as well as community members to talk about malnutrition, I think this is our challenge. And you know, politicians often, they have their own interests. I think that's our biggest challenge. I guess the other that I see here is we have policies and laws that are not pro-nutrition. Uh, and so they don't really support nutrition. I'll give one example here. The government of Tanzania, for instance, imposes a tax uh, for micronutrients that are imported in the country. So you, they have to pay 18% VAT, but they have to also pay additional taxes that is about 2.1 or 2.2%, making 20% on the micronutrients that is imported uh, into the country. This means that the poorest people will not be able to afford the micronutrients because of the taxes that are added there. So these are the policies that I think they are not pro um, nutrition. I think uh, what I also see, and I think the global no, uh, north, you can help that, is that the government is trying to balance between investing in its own people by reducing the tax. But at the same time, it has to collect the tax to repay the, the loans that they have had for various development projects. So balancing that I think it's, a, it's another um, challenge or problem that we have. And I think the push from the global north um, on the dates that the government has to pay, I think is also um, an important area. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Majari. We're gonna bring you back for the panel, just Q and A for everything, but i um, really grateful for your partnership and for your time with us today. So, Thank you. Thank you. Next, I'm excited to welcome Joel Spicer, uh, President and CEO of Nutrition International, and as Joanne mentioned, a longtime partner and friend of Results. Uh, I think, you know, especially when he was working at the Stop TV partnership, uh, it was often a, a go to whenever we were stuck on a problem on tuberculosis. It was like, let's ask Joel, let's ask Joel. Uh, so <laughs> we're really grateful um, for his time. He's an incredible global health leader who's built and led initiatives and partnerships in nutrition, MCH, that's maternal and child health, TB, HIV, innovative finance, and importantly, resource mobilization. That's the key on, on all of this is getting some new money to the to fight these issues. Um, and Results has been lucky enough to work with him in many or maybe all of the places he's worked. We can aid in government, UNICEF, Stop TV, Partnership, World Bank, and now Nutrition International. So I'm just um, so glad you're here. Welcome, Joel. Thanks, Cricket. It's great to be here. And I should just add, through my whole career, going back almost 25 years in terms of partnership with Results, I've been the guy on the inside who's had to you know, write letters back to your volunteers, sometimes like with frustration, but also with appreciation, knowing that it works. I've seen what has happened to my bosses in different places, whether it's the World Bank, whether it's the Canadian government, and the impact of results volunteers writing letters in the media that we then have to respond to with talking points to the minister or whatever it is, it works. I can tell you from the inside, keep doing it. I'm very proud to be an honorary member of the results family, I have to say, and it's great to be here with all of you. Thanks, Cricket. Oh, that's, that's so lovely to hear, and we're we're, we're very persistent, I, those volunteers, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, to start us off, I wanted to ask a couple of questions, and so um, your work now at Nutrition International, it's about improving the nutritional st status of people worldwide, especially women, adolescent girls, and children, and we often, you know, hear about how important food security is. I've recently been essaying, we need food and nutrition security in all of my conversations with the Hill and mm -hmm. with government, trying to add that nutrition piece in there. Can you just explain a little bit why nutrition needs to be prioritized, particularly given the many crises we're facing right now in the world? Absolutely. Um, so at very high level, food security approaches tend to prioritize the availability access and affordability of a limited range of staple foods. I know it's more than that, but just to illustrate the simple difference. A food security approach will, for example, try to make sure that a child is not hungry, which is super important, except that you can take away a child's hunger by filling their belly with something that's not particularly nutritious, has no micronutrients or, or um, um, so vitamins or minerals, and is very starchy, let's say, but they can still be heavily malnourished. 
I think nutrition security approaches focus on getting the right nutrients into the body at the right time, at critical points in the life cycle. So the first thousand days of a child's life, adolescents in particular for adolescent girls, pregnant women in particular. Um, so it would really focus in the example of that child on making sure the child is not malnourished because they have access to the vitamins and minerals they need for their brain, their body, and their immune system, as Dr. Peter was saying, to grow and develop fully. They'll measure things like lives saved, stunting or anemia averted, uh, breastfeeding coverage, low birth weight, things like that. Neither approach should stand alone, and both are really important for improving people's lives. But one of the differences I've seen in the last couple of years, particularly in the era of the poly crisis that we're in, is that in the media, the dominant narrative has been about food, starvation, hunger, and food security. And people and donors in particular, I think, are forgetting about nutrition. The fact is we need both. And I liked what you said about nutrition security. I think that's the term to go with there. Um, we need both or we're just gonna keep rowing in circles. As one of Nutrition International's other board members uh, is fond of saying, that's former president of Tanzania, Dr. Jakaya Kikwete. He says, many heads of state still do not know the difference between food and nutrition, and we have to change that. So from my point of view, it's, it's time to shine a brighter light on nutrition globally and bring it back into focus. And as to your question about why malnutrition is, is uh, so important right now and why focusing on nutrition is critical, I'd say three things. Malnutrition is an important problem, it's an urgent problem, and it's a solvable problem. Now, what do I mean by that? I think echoing some of, of uh, Dr. Peter's comments, which, which I very much appreciated, it's an important problem because malnutrition is slowing down our efforts in other areas as well, to save lives, to improve health, to tackle infectious diseases, to improve education outcomes, and to end poverty. It's not one issue among many. And I think sometimes donors silo nutrition as to one thing and education as another thing, but nutrition is actually a foundational prerequisite for human beings to survive and thrive. And Joanne put out some statistics. I'm not gonna go into too many more, but if one out of three people on the planet suffers some form of malnutrition or another, and it's particularly hard hitting on women and girls um, with more than 1 billion of them impacted. I mean, we're not going to reach gender equality targets either unless we tackle the root causes of malnutrition as well. It's that one statistic I want to double click on though for a minute that Joanne mentioned. And it's that, um, you know, almost 50% of preventable child mortality has malnutrition as the underlying cause. Now, I want us to think about that. Malnutrition contributes almost half of preventable deaths in children under five. That's more than 2 million children every year that didn't actually have to die. Yet we barely invest 1% of our Overseas Development Assistance, ODA, on nutrition, and many countries themselves are not investing enough to make that difference that we can make. It doesn't make any sense to my head, and it also doesn't make any sense to my heart, actually, that we live in a world um, that has so much, so many resources, and yet we choose to allow this level of preventable human damage to continue year after year. And I know costs are going up for every government, even in donor countries, just having managed COVID and other things. They're struggling with multiple shocks, pressures on budget. I get that. But the world is not just dealing with a cost of living crisis. We're dealing with a cost of loving crisis, actually. We're being quite stingy um, because those things that could create a huge difference at very low cost that could alleviate massive amounts of suffering for our fellow human beings are not getting done the way they should be. So, if we believe that every life has equal value and that the purpose of being here is to leave the world better than we found it and to create the maximum light possible together, then the first thing we would do is roll up our sleeves and focus on malnutrition and on getting the money that's required because it's one of the most cost-effective, solvable um, problems that's out there right now. I mentioned it's an urgent challenge, and it's urgent because the combination of crises that Joanne talked about, from COVID to climate to conflict, and the growing debt crisis, which really has me worried, actually, it impacts the most vulnerable members of society, right? People living in poverty. And it's already ro rolling back decades of progress in the fight against malnutrition anyway. We talked about wasted children rising, but anemia is also rising. Dr. Peter mentioned that too, among women and adolescent girls. So more than 600 million of them suffer from anemia. 
And this is driving a resurgence in maternal mortality, particularly among adolescent girls that, that get pregnant. Africa is also particularly hard hit with more stunted children every year. So I agree with that statement made before that we are off uh, target for our sustainable development goal ambitions and nutrition targets. And unless we lean in right now and make it a top priority, we're on track for hundreds of millions of people to pass on a legacy of missed opportunities, increased vulnerabilities, and reduced hope to the next generation. So it's very clear that investing in nutrition today is going to prevent a significant amount of harm tomorrow. Last point, I'm not over time. Finally, it's that malnutrition is a solvable problem. There's evidence out there for what we need to do, which interventions to scale up and what their effects will be. Now, have we figured out how to design a perfect food system that's good for planet and people and gets everyone a nutritious meal every day, everywhere? No, we have not. That's a complex problem. It's gonna take time and we're starting to focus on it more, which is great. But we know enough already to save millions of additional lives between now and 2030 if we choose to do so. And frankly, it would cost less than North America spends on Halloween candy and ice cream per year. So it's not really a question of resources. Nutrition is a political issue and ending malnutrition is a political choice. And that's why conversations like these with groups like Results who educate and advocate with decision makers around the world are so critically important. Thanks. Thank you, Joel. So many good points there. I'm just nodding along, nodding along, really grateful. And yeah, and I think the last point is the investments are critical and we, we continue, continue to need to put more resources into this work. Um, well, I'm going to go ahead and move on to Dorothy and invite you back for the Q&A at the end, Joel. Um, so Dorothy, Dorothy Monza um, is the Results Senior Associate for Nutrition and Child Health and um, a dear colleague of mine. Uh, she leads the implementation for our Global Maternal Nutrition Child Health Advocacy Strategy and works with our grassroots advocates and our international partners to influ influence U.S. government funding and policy and is a really a, just a leader in the nutrition space. Um, all of our colleagues um, turn to me and say, oh my gosh, Dorothy's doing this, Dorothy's doing that. And they're just so grateful for her being out there moving and shaking. Um, so Dorothy, I'm, I'm glad to have you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here and um, want to give some of that those compliments back. Cricket as you know, one of my mentors and um, really kind of biggest allies and advocates in my own career, but also in kind of the results world. Um, really grateful for all the colleagues who frankly make me look good in, in what I do. So <laughs> very happy to be here. Well, speaking of results, we're an anti-poverty organization. Others have touched on this, but can you talk a little bit more about how nutrition and poverty are intersecting and why it's such a critical issue for results to work on. Yes, and thank you for this question. Um, and I'm kind of excited to build on. And I think some of my main points were um, also covered by Joel and Dr. Bajari. So hard crowd to, to follow. But uh, I really kind of want to accentuate the point about the difference between malnutrition and hunger. Um, malnutrition is one of the worst deprivations that people can endure. And I want to start off by saying also that families living in poverty are some of the most thrifty, creative, and tenacious people. And I've heard countless stories and seen personally the extreme lengths that parents will go to to provide for their children, including forgoing other vital expenses like education or health care um, or skipping meals for themselves or their older children or migrating for work, even if the journey is dangerous and takes them far away from their families. And all of those are kind of part of this very vicious cycle and two-way link between malnutrition and poverty. And what I mean by that is malnutrition, it negatively affects physical and mental health and social standing and opportunities, which makes people more susceptible to poverty. And poverty reinforces malnutrition because it increases the risk that people will not have enough food. And like Joel was saying, nutritious food are the right types of foods that they need to regain their health and stay healthy. 
another thing that has kind of jumped out to me on, on the relationship between malnutrition and poverty is Dr. Bajari sharing, you know, the Tanzanian national stunting rate of, you know, three in 10 and how that jumps to four in 10 in the more um, impoverished households and up to one in two in other areas. And we see this trend globally as well. You know, according to UNICEF, around 20% of children globally are stunted. Um, in low-income countries, that number is closer to 35%. And in high-income countries, it's around 3%. So we know that there are a lot of dynamics around poverty and malnutrition. Um, and like Joel said, it does not need to be this way. We um, have a lot of data and evidence and research base and things that we are ready to scale up today. But one of the biggest um, kind of issues beyond just the, the devastation for, for families and communities is that because malnutrition affects some of the most impoverished people in the most impoverished countries in the world, um, there isn't the same amount of kind of political will or attention that it deserves. Um, and so I'm really proud to be part of the results movement and um, partner with people like Dr. Bajari and others in the Action Network to raise awareness about this and be generating um, the political will. And just one, one more thing too, is that, um, you know, poverty isn't the only factor that makes people more vulnerable to malnutrition. We're hearing about, you know, the needs of women and girls and young children specifically. And those populations tend to be some of the most um, disempowered in society and some of the most overlooked. And so that's another reason why, um, this issue is so important and why it can be so transformational when we address it. Thanks so much, Dorothy. I, you, you started talking about political will. Let's talk about that. Addressing these problems at scale is really needed. Results has been creating political will to address malnutrition and for decades, you know, our, our acronym was responsibility for ending starvation, you know, but it's a very, very much have been working on this for 40 years. Um, can you talk to just what we've done in the past year um, to, and really some of the successes around political will and building political will results is that? Yes, I would be happy to. And I, I definitely think of results as being kind of in the, the business of building political will. So this is a great question. Um, one thing that I think has been really great is last Congress, uh, Results was working to get co-sponsors and support for a bill called the Global Malnutrition Prevention and Treatment Act. This bill um, directs our main global health agency, USAID, to create and implement an action plan on how they're going to address malnutrition, including by um, increasing coverage of some of the preventative um, treatments and kind of therapeutic treatments that we know work. But um, beyond kind of the bill passing, I think what um, is really transformational and what we're really building on this year is that results volunteers had so many conversations with members of Congress and their staff. And our ask was that they support this bill, but beyond that, it was an opportunity for us to really educate them on some of these dynamics we've been talking about um, and to kind of not let people pass the buck because you sometimes will hear, you know, oh, that nutrition, that's kind of a problem in the agriculture sector, or that's a problem for the health sector, or, um, you know, the social protection sector. And like Joanne was saying, you know, nutrition it cuts through all of these different um, all these different sectors because we are one whole person and our nutrition is so foundational to our health that we can't just dissect it out like that. Um, so I think one hand, kind of the education and working to make sure that members of Congress know about um, kind of the smart policy decisions we can do to amplify the impact of every dollar the U.S. invests in nutrition. And then kind of the flip side of that coin is that we're also pushing for them to invest more. Like we were saying, you know, this problem is very underfunded for the amount of lives it affects. Um, and so this year results, we mobilized the grassroots network for a set the agenda campaign. We've held over 175 meetings since January. And a lot of those meetings have focused on the US global health budget, um, educating members of Congress and their staff about what needs there are around maternal and child health and why nutrition is such an under underutilized tool to address that. Um, so I'm happy to say that for one of our um, 
advocacy tools. It's called a Dear Colleague Letter, where we ask members of Congress to publicly sign on and support for funding these programs. Despite a very difficult budget environment this year, we secured more signers than we ever have before. 42 members of the Senate from both parties signed on to that letter saying that they wanted robust funding for maternal and child health. And I'm not sure where I am on my time, but I want to tell an anecdote too that Cricket and I heard that we have other colleagues who work in DC in the advocacy space and they see what we do and they admire it. And they're like, how did you guys, you know, accomplish this? And we're like, it was not us. It was the, the network of grassroots constituent advocates across the country. And the fact that we approach advocacy as a marathon and not a sprint. You know, we don't just show up once a year saying, sign this bill, sign this letter. Um, you know, people are out there building relationships, building trust. And that I think trust is the most important thing um, to have with members of Congress because they're, um, they're very mindful of kind of their public appearance and they are balancing a lot of priorities. And when we have that credibility and trust with them, we're able to move forward as partners in a much more kind of strong and coordinated way. So still kind of celebrating that letter and to highlight too that um, that is seven more members than signed on last year. So we can see when we concentrate on these issues as advocates, we can really um, bump up the political support. And it's really about not just building political will, but maintaining it year after year so that we can um, deliver on these long-term solutions. So I think I'll end it there because I know there's a lot of questions and um, would love to hear um, from my fellow panelists' perspective on those as well. So back to you, Cricket. Thanks, Dorothy. And we'll keep you and we'll add um, uh, Dr. Bajari and um, Joel back in. And it's, well, I just want to say we have had a lot of questions. A lot of folks submitted questions beforehand. We've got some questions in the chat. So I'm going to combine a couple of them and, and kind of have a little bit more of a discussion. Um, so for the first thing for our audience Q&A, you know, we've heard a lot about the incredible solutions for fighting malnutrition and know these interventions aren't getting everywhere they're needed and investments are far, far too low globally, even in the U.S.'s own budget. Um, Y'all might be really surprised to hear, but out of the almost 13 billion for global health, and we're talking about in the health sector, not the food security sector, or the humanitarian sector, but the health sector, where you have that those critical interventions that are focused on that thousand day window. Um, we have a, a particular account called the Nutrition and Global Health Account at USAID, but of the 13 billion in <laughs> global health spending, um, nutrition funding last year was only at 160 million, and that's just over 1% of our global health budget. I mean, you talk about the under five child deaths and the mortality, and ha almost half of those under five child deaths are attributed to malnutrition. Um, it, it feels like it's an outsized problem, and we're not actually meeting the need or really giving it the, the really support that it needs within, you know, the, the under five child death work. So I wanted to start with a question of what kind of public pressure do you think is needed to demand for an urgent response to this issue? And Dr. Bajari, it would be great if you could say something about Tanzania and kind of our, our North-South partnerships on this. Would you, would you be willing to start? What kind of public yeah. pressure is needed? Yeah. Um, so I I think uh, it has been really said that we need political decision. Um, that's what we need. And I think for this to happen, maybe uh, two or three things. One, I think, is our uh, sustained engagement with the politicians and political leaders in the space. Not one off, I think, sustained engagement to help them understand um, why nutrition is at the center of every other thing that, that we're talking about. It is the center of HIV care treatment, the center of TB treatment, the center of uh, maternal child health, the center, center of many things. I think that's one thing that we need. And so we need some resources for that one, sustained engagement. And secondly, I feel that we need um, to make nutrition as a public health problem in the eyes of the communities, not in the eyes of the 
healthcare providers, but in the eyes of communities, because then two things will really happen. Number one is that they are going to take necessary action in their own space. But number two, they're also going to demand from their leaders um, to prioritize and make sure nutrition issues are well addressed and prioritize in the planning and the budgets as well. So that's what I think. I think on a global um, north, I think a lot of noise has to continually be made on the um, World Bank and IMF. Um, you know, as uh, Doroth mentioned, very good work within the Senate um, that push that. And, and uh, we all, all have said the issue around financing nutrition is not because there are no finances, it's because it just has not been prioritized. So I think pressure uh, on the financing institutions, um, they are financing institutions for pan different pandemic. And, and so we need to be talking about financing nutrition as well. And as Joel said, in the seven years um, down the line, the this, this situation seems to probably will be getting worse because of the health climate that we're seeing, because of displacement that we're seeing. We're seeing already prices double what they were uh, before COVID. And so this is an alarming situation. I think that we all need to rally around and build the pressure on the decision makers, politicians, as well as community leaders and community members. Thank you. I'm done cricket. Hello. Hi, Dr. Uh, Dr. Joel, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, do you have something to add on kind of the global advocacy space and kind of the public pressure that we need to demand um, for these resources? Yeah, uh, I would agree with with a lot of what Peter said. It's a really powerful point about getting communities to care. Um, here are three quick thoughts. So we need to make a strong case in nutrition to the right targets, right? Often the nutrition community talks to itself. That's a problem. We need to be able to translate our arguments to decision makers who can understand it in terms of what will I get if I invest this amount of money in these things? What's the health and human capital benefit? What's the economic benefit? What's the cost of inaction if I do nothing? What's the damage that will come to me and to my economy if I do nothing? So we need to make a strong case. We need action forcing moments and we need champions, those things. So in terms of the, um, the role of results, I see results as pretty critical for making that case, for translating the technical into the political. And that node is critical in this, in this particular battle. Um, in terms of action forcing moments, when I look 12 months ahead um, or even farther, I ask myself, what's it gonna take for multilateral development banks to put more money on the table? Because a lot of additional resources in a constrained environment are beginning to stack up in multilateral development banks. Um, what's it gonna take for the World Bank to have nutrition smart indicators across all social sector lending like the African Development Bank already does, right? So all social protection, all ag, all water, all education, all health programs from the African Development Bank can track what proportion of those lending operations are nutrition smart. The World Bank cannot. Let's change that for all multilateral development banks. What's it going to take for donors to come to the table at the Nutrition for Growth Summit in France with meaningful, focused, increased commitments that can be measured and that are appropriate to the urgency of the moment? And I think, Cricket, your point was that the level of funding from the most powerful economy in the world is probably a little off, right? So appropriate to the urgency of the moment. And what's it going to take for countries to hold the line and increase their investments in nutrition and even honor their existing commitments? When I think of the greatest strength of a group like Results, I think about the G7. And what's it gonna take for the G7 to make nutrition a priority in the way that connects Japan, who's hosting now, with Italy, who's already a nutrition champion, next, and Canada, who's a nutrition champion, after that, in 2025. Organizations like Results have the ability to conduct linked up multi-target advocacy, which is very rare. So you can coordinate policy positions on different G7 countries, for example. I'm hopeful about that. The last point is one that's just a point on hope. I don't see any region that's holding a torch as high for nutrition as Africa right now. And I am inspired and a lot of my heroes are coming from Africa. Uh, the African Union, for example, has declared a year of action on nutrition. We're working in support of them with others. Uh, so Commissioner Samate, Minata Samate, the AU commissioner responsible, 
is incredibly dedicated to this. Chakaya Kukwete, incredibly de dedicated to this. Ibrahim Mayaki, former PM of Niger, former head of NEPAD, incredibly dedicated to nutrition and food and bringing them closer together. King Letsi of Lesotho, the list goes on and on. So I think doubling down on these champions, building more and doing whatever we can to support their efforts and their leadership is something we should definitely look at closer. Thanks, Cricket. Thank you, Joel. I, I agree, agree. It's just the just hearing the names and saying like they're all of these folks are are leading and how are we in, you know, in the global north joining them um, is something that I really, <laughs> really are trying to fight to do, especially, you know, with our grassroots and trying to get our members of Congress to pay attention. Dorothy, you want to talk a little bit on our model um, and how that matters and actually moving the yeah, members of Congress and uh, the media on nutrition here in the US. Yes, I would love to. And I, I took a peek at the attendees and I see a lot of um, familiar names, people who are volunteers and donors and people who I had the pleasure of seeing in person this past week in Washington. So if you were at the Pacific Northwest Conference, hello again. Um, so I may be uh, a little redundant for some of you, but I also want to take the time to celebrate you and the work that you're doing and the fact that we know we've seen it anecdotally from results, but we've also seen it in studies and research from groups like the Congressional Management Foundation, that constituent advocacy is so impactful to decision makers and members of Congress. And as much as we um, can provide data and make the case. And I love what Joel said about this kind of being um, loving work because we really make the moral and ethical case for these programs. But the reality of the world is that the US Congress feels accountable to the people who live here in their district. Um, when it comes to tough decisions around funding, um, it, there isn't that incentive for them to stick their neck out for global programs sometimes to maintain them, let alone call for increases. And so that is why the continual attention from results is so key. There's a lot of people who, when they kind of need something, they'll go to Congress and say, we really need you to do this. And maybe that will get pushed to the end of the year, or there won't really be a vote on it. And Congress kind of feels like, oh, okay, we kind of got away with that one for now. And then, you know, the next Congress results will be there saying, you know, this bill didn't pass last Congress. It needs to pass this Congress. Or last year, this was flat funded. We need it to be increased this year. And we're always continually working with offices and taking those kind of incremental steps to be champions. Uh, we know champions aren't built overnight, but the more that offices take action, the more they see that people care and are responding and that they're the people who decide if they have a job, the more willing and eager they will be to take increased action in the future. So I really see the results model as uh, kind of incrementally building on our successes. And um, sometimes things don't seem like a success. You know, if a, if a bill doesn't pass, it seems like it wasn't a success, but you know, you're not starting back from zero, the next Congress, you're starting from, you know, that base of support. So I would say uh, we're really tenacious and um, that's, that's something I love. Um, I'm inspired by it personally, but I see firsthand the impact it can have in the world. Thanks so much, Dorothy. Speaking of bills that haven't passed, um, so just yesterday, uh, you had Senator Collins speaking very powerfully in front of the head of USAID, Ambassador um, Samantha Power, our Administrator Samantha Power now, um, uh, in front of a state foreign operations hearing uh, around appropriations and annual funding. And Senator Collins brought up her bill, the Reach Every Mother and Child Act. If folks remember, that was a bill around maternal child health and nutrition results has worked on for years and supports. And particularly, we talk about in that bill, the need to prioritize highest impact evidence-based interventions. And Senator Collins, who's now ranking member of the entire appropriations of the Senate, called that out in front of Samantha Power yesterday. Uh, we we have really have been trying to get you know language around highest impact evidence-based interventions in um, legislation for years now. And I wanted to go back to jo Joel, particularly with your work at Nutrition International. Would you be 
willing to just talk a little bit about the examples of nutrition interventions. I think a lot of folks have been asking in the questions, what are some of the, what are the things, micronutrients and the products um, that are really having a outsized impact in the nutrition space? Uh, would you be, could you just give a couple of examples there? Um, particularly, sure. I think someone in the, in the comments was asking about plumpy nut and, and um, severe acute malnutrition. So just to give, pull all that back together. Great. So it's a tough question because I have more than one or two, but I'm going to try and keep it focused. They're all Let's really go to important. Two. <laughs> I know. I, I like it when evidence and data combined with information about cost come together in a really powerful way, because in a resource constrained environment, I strongly believe we should prioritize lowest cost, highest impact for scale first. Um, and I think I come to, uh, but before we go into that, though, like I should add, what we choose to scale up is important, but how we choose to scale it up is even more important, mm -hmm. right? Like an imposed solution from a donor looking for a silver bullet is never going to work. To have impact, it's got to be sustainable. The country has to have the evidence. They have to be behind it. They have to plan it, roll it out. Um, and that's a really important part of this question. I, I'll leave it there for now. But just on the intervention side, because that was the question, I'm going to lead with vitamin A capsules. I know Results has been an important advocate for that. Nutrition International has been involved and purchases uh, enough vitamin A to cover 150 million children every year with two doses. So it's a very important intervention from our point of view. Why? It's essential for children's immune system health. It protects them from a lot of preventable illness and death, uh, prevents them from blindness. It cuts child mortality uh, from all causes by 12%, diarrhea by 15%, measles, by 50% and it costs two cents per capsule to produce. It's gotta be one of the lowest cost, highest impact interventions out there. More support is desperately needed. Uh, we're working with our partners, UNICEF and also Helen Keller International on this. Um, large scale food fortification is a, a, a quick win from my point of view, adding vitamins and minerals to staple foods like wheat, maize, rice, cooking oil and salt that many people living in poverty consume on a daily basis. It's pennies per person per year. It has a strong evidence base. It can reduce anemia by 25% and neural tube defects among newborns by almost half. Honorable mention, multiple micronutrient supplements and breastfeeding. Those, and there are many more, but that would be that, my, my four. That's, those are great. I, I remember seeing um, actually a food fortification site in Tanzania that, um, um, health promotion Tanzania connected us with when we were taking a congressional trip to um, have members of Congress and their staff look at programs on the ground. And it was it's just amazing to see how it, it was uh, just a, a, a maze, like <laughs> silo kind of thing. And they were adding it in into the corn and then selling it at a reduced cost so that everyone would buy that, the fortified one, instead of this other, the non-fortified one to, to really try, try and incentivize the fortified foods. Um, Dr. Bajari, do you have um, a particular thing that we've, oh, you asked, a, you answered a question, sorry. What would you say would have the most impact components of partnerships between Global South and Global North for addressing malnutrition. And you said um, the government of Tanzania responded to national and international advocacy by allocating funding for children under five. Do you have anything else you'd want to say about um, how partnerships between the Global South and North made this happen and what more could be done? Thank you, Cricket. Um, so I I think um, we're all agreeing that there's a value between uh, partnership in global south and global north in a way that um, we're not living in an island. So the things that happens here in Tanzania are, can be influenced locally, but it can also be influenced globally. So that link for us being able to understand what are the global commitments that has been made and, and the push that happens in the global north. It links very well with what we are also advocating here at national level. Um, talking about uh, fortification, food fortification, for instance, as an example, this is a program that the government has embraced in the, la in the, in the last, I think, eight years or, or 10 years, something like that. But it hasn't been fully operationalized to say, um, let's remove all the taxes 
or all the minerals or uh, micronutrients that uh, are used into fortification. I think the global north and, and us working at national level would be uh, um, a, a good area to actually advocate together for us to advocate on our minister for finance or government to uh, remove those taxes and put legislation that mandates every producer from the local ones into the middle um, size and the largest to make sure that um, they all uh, um, fortify the food that goes into the market. But this could also be, um, you know, pushed from the global north as, as the, the advocacy happens within the USAID, for instance, within the World Bank, within the IMF and G7, et cetera, et cetera, um, that we have the local environment that allows and mandates everybody who produces um, grains and, and flowers and things like that to make sure that they, they ensure that uh, fortification happens before the, the product goes out. I think this will make a lot of value um, Joe mentioned about vitamin A. We also have, also have, you know, iron and folic acid, for instance, as other minerals that matters a lot because, I mean, you're talking about half of the women of reproductive age anemic. So, you know, that fortification will make, um, you know, mileage for maternal health and child death as well. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Majari. Um, well, I want to end with one final question for our panelists and kind of a short and sweet. Um, how do we make everyday malnutrition a newsworthy instead of, you know, being upended by other things, you know, every, every other crisis? How do we make everyday malnutrition newsworthy instead of being upended by other things like famine and other, other um, emergency settings? Joel, do you want to start? Sure. It's a tough question because I get despondent watching the news because it focuses on bad news stories all the time. Like if it bleeds, it leads. And so I, I think ending malnutrition is going to take focus, constancy, and determination beyond the attention span of a news cycle or the average politician. And I think that's why we need to build each other up and work in these kinds of new strategic partnerships to make sure that good news stories are going. If there was news that only focused on good news as well. I probably tune into that channel a little bit more. So um, the good news stories will ultimately be told by parents who are able to see their children grow up and become what they were always meant to be. Um, and I'm, I'm here for that story. Thanks. Yeah, kind of to build off of what Joel said, I think that you know, we're in a place where there's so much need in the world around so many issues and we're more connected and able to hear about it than ever. And so I think a lot of people as kind of a defense mechanism, like it kind of goes in one ear and out the other. And one thing that I've found is that rather than leading kind of with statistics or things like that, even though the need is dire, what results does really well is connecting with people based on why we care about these things and what our values are. And I find that kind of draws people in more than, than hearing of, you know, maybe a global report, but to say like, this is why I'm involved. This is how I took political action in my community on it. I think that not only kind of makes a connection with the other person, but it also shows them, like Joel was saying, some of those solutions. So it's not just like there is overwhelming malnutrition in the world. It's that there is and that we can solve it. And so I think, yeah, leading with, with our values, why we care, um, and yeah, making sure people know this problem is solvable. In addition to in addition to what Joe and, and Dorothy says, I, I feel that maybe another way is to market nutrition, same as Coca-Cola uh, is being marketed, you know, to kind of show uh, on a daily basis as much as we can, the value that vitamin C or vegetables or, you know, some nutrition food that it has and present a value that it adds in the life and the health of children as they grow. Um, many times, I think our uh, health uh, products are not marketed 
we tend to think that they are known, but they're actually not known. So maybe uh, marketing um, nutrition product then show the value that they add in a human face and, and, and you know, not in the numbers and percentage, probably that would, uh, would, would add value. And I finally, I, I think sustained engagement with decision makers and politicians, um, I think would make a lot of impact in the future. Thank you. Thanks so much for this entire panel. It's been incredible talking to you. I'm going to um, end our, our panel discussion and turn it back over with a huge thank you and turn it back over to Joanne, our executive director. Mm, thanks. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Peter, Joel, Dorothy Cricket, for being with us, for informing us on these um, urgent and vital issues and mm, for your leadership and work um, day in and day out. Um, I also want to really say a thanks to the results development team for putting this event together and Leslie Reed for really spearheading things. Um, thanks to all of you who joined us today for this really critical discussion. I hope you found it valuable. Um, it underpins the work that we do. And I also want to say, again, my deep gratitude to everyone listening who supported results work with your generous donations. Um, truly, your support makes the work that Dorothy described and frankly, all of our work possible, right? It's critical for driving our grassroots efforts. It it gives us the space and allows us to innovate. It complements foundation support that we get to really be able to su fully support the advocacy that we need to do. And that advocacy continues to be so vital because as we heard, funding for nutrition and political leadership isn't keeping pace with the need and also isn't keeping pace with the opportunity that we have that you heard from folks for transformational impact. You know, results exist to pressure political leaders to do what is necessary to support proven and equitable solutions that can save and change lives if they're delivered at scale. And we're going to continue to do that with your support and partnership. So I'm really grateful to have all of you um, who are on this webinar today as part of our community. And uh, Thanks for being with us. Um, we will continue this work with you and together and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much for being with us.